start again. Yeah. Hiya, my name's Martin Dempsey. I'm from Rosendale in Lancashire, close to the Yorkshire border, not too far away from Burnley. Um, I initially, when I left school, went to do my pre-diploma in art in Leeds, which I found fascinating and quite mind-blowing because my perception of art was quite naive at the time. And we had some amazing staff there that just turned my world upside down. Uh, I then worked for a year as a, an apprentice stonemason and then I went to Bretton Hall College to do art and drama and I'd been there for the first year and decided it wasn't really for me although I did have a good time there and we did do some quite crazy things there I think we instigated what became the Yorkshire Sculpture Park because we started doing kind of Dardoist and Surrealist stuff around the grounds putting on various gigs at the uh, student union building Notably people like Ivor Cutler and Lol Cox, so a whole variety of stuff really. Uh, I met the young Dave Rappaport there, if you remember Dave Rappaport, who again bumped into when I came over to Liverpool. Anyway, whilst I was still at college, I decided to apply to Liverpool. I'd always been fascinated with Liverpool because of the the Liverpool scene, as in the band, the Adrian Henry uh, pattern, etc. And I made it my, my kind of purpose that did when I did get here, I would try and find out where these people were, where they hung out. Said, well, it didn't take more than a couple of days because they all drank in the crack around the corner from the art college. And um, I got to know them quite early on and found them fascinating. I'd always been fascinated by Adrian Henry's book, Tonight at Noon. And um, in fact, utilised some of that when I did my English A-level. Uh, really enjoyed it. But I like the whole idea of it being a cross between performance and art and their approach to that. And, and the kind of connections that Adrian had in America as well and that was my main reason for coming to Liverpool. The music side of it, obviously you know you're going to say people like the Beatles have been to the Arcos, it wasn't really about that for me, it was about finding like-minded people because I knew I wanted to do performance stuff, I didn't consider, I never considered, I still don't consider myself a musician although I'm still playing but it was a case of finding the right kind of personalities and characters to work with one of which is sat with us now, um, but it was putting that kind of a group together and we didn't, we never saw ourselves as being, I don't think, as being a band, it was more about a group of personalities that could work together and make something happen and if that happened to be musical well, then that's fine but it could have quite easily been something else as, as John and Henry did in various projects like the um, surfing the Leeds Liverpool Canal project etc which was all fascinating stuff and at the college there was a lot of very like-minded people and I find I just found it fascinating, perfect for me. And I've been here ever since. So um, I ended up working in the Everyman where I worked with Delia for a time who owns the place that was currently sat in. Um, and that was doing kind of youth arts projects around youth clubs all over Merseyside. And me being the kind of, as referred to as the woolly back and having Delia as the professional scally. <laughs> um, which of course she wasn't, but a very creative person and um, still working in that kind of creative way and creating environments like this of course. So you were born in? Rossendale. Yeah, and um, what type of a house did you live in? Uh, we shared a house with my grandparents, it was a small semi, but we had some land at the side because my granddad used to breed and work English Spring Spaniels, gun dogs. So I used to go all over the country with him to various estates and farms where he'd, he'd go shooting and I'd stay in the kitchens or play with the kids on the farm. Uh, and we went to some fairly interesting places, I have to admit. I managed to learn to drive at the age of about 13 because my granddad was getting very old. The roads were so quiet and we set off at 6 o'clock in the morning or 5 o'clock and I'd just be sat on his knee steering the car up to the Lake District or the, the Dales or something like that. Uh, Always been fascinated by landscape, always been fascinated by industrial landscapes, canals, railways, you name it, still am. Um, and of course Liverpool has a fantastic history of that as well. When we were actually at college, uh, the demise of the docks was already well in process. Uh, but it became a really good source of pieces of wood, rope, wire, you name it, you could find it on the docks. And nobody seemed to be bothered about us taking it back up to the art college. There was a bit of a scenario with this wood that we got that was used for the dock gates, which is called Greenheart. Uh, we took it into college and started trying to make things with it and then got told that uh, if you do get a splinter, you, it can be very poisonous. 
but um, that was Pete Atten's department, who again was another of our contemporaries, who was at Rochdale with John. Uh, I knew Pete from Rosendale, because he was from Rosendale, where I'm from, and he'd been working with my brother in the summer holidays in a factory, and said, oh, Pete's going to uh, Liverpool, to college. I said, you going to the art college? He said, yeah. So we ended up getting a flat together on Upper Parliament Street, and I think we'd been there for about a week, and I can recall, on, I'll never forget John turning up about a week late for college, just come back from France or Greece or somewhere, and I was just kind of, not so much in awe, but we, we were instantly kind of kindred spirits, we were both very much interested in Northern Soul, as it became known at the time, we just regarded it as soul music, we were into the whole kind of, the tail end of the mod thing and, and all that, but we were always, and Pete as well, we were also interested in the kind of fashion side of it, if you will. Uh, and that's why Deaf School were particularly interesting, because Deaf School would have been in their third year when we were in the first year. Uh, so we became friendly with Deaf School, and that's how we ended up initially borrowing their room and equipment in the art college to start doing our own thing, which we did, and that became the band Albert Dock. Um, so yeah, that's, that's, that's where that came from. What did your parents do for a living? My father had been in education following a stint in the RAF. My mother was a school dinner lady. Uh, they were both fairly political. My dad was a local Labour councillor. He then went to work over in Oldham and in Blackburn and in um, somewhere else near Manchester, I forgot what it's called now. Uh, they both passed away in the last 10 years. But they were very much kind of working class really and then we moved when I was about 13 we moved to a slightly bigger house uh, further up the valley uh, which was a lovely big stone house which I really like um, but it was a slightly smaller village that we moved to only a pub a post office a butcher's and, you know a few houses that's about it really so it's quite parochial um, so from from an early age, I knew I had to. I knew I had to get out. I was when I was young. I started not doing as well as I should have done at school. So my dad had a brilliant idea. He said, "Right, you've got options. You had a book up at school, or you're going in the mill. You know what that looks like." But your uncle Terry's taking you down the pit next Saturday morning, and my uncle took me down the coal pit in Burnley, and I knew I was going to book up at school because I thought there's no way I can do this because basically that's what lads from where I'm from. You either took up a trade, or you worked in the mill, or you worked in the pit, and there wasn't very many other options. So I thought, right, my priority is book up at school and get out to Rosendale, which is what I did. But I had a lot of help from my uncle, who was teaching art in Accrington at the time. Funnily enough, taught um, Tim Whitaker, the ex deaf school drummer. Um, and he got me interested in, I, I was always interested in drawing, but he kind of gave me different options for drawing. Um, and he also made, he was also doing printmaking. So that kind of expanded me. He, he was a bit of a beatnik, if you will. He's got some really nice work in the textile museum in Bradford still. He used to work with Joseph Conroe um, in a Manchester office. So he's quite well respected and he, he's still alive. He has a lovely book out at the moment on uh, Jazz in the Northwest, which is a black and white, um, it's an art book. And he photographs some of the biggest names in jazz that played around the Northwestern scene which was basically places like cricket clubs working men's clubs and, and some of the photographs and some of the artists involved here is incredible and to think that was in like 1950s and 60s lancashire is quite quite amazing really did you go to art school to be an artist or to be in a band i went to art school to find out what i wanted to do um i haven't got a, a pre defined idea of what I thought art was at that time or what I wanted to do with art or which way it would go. I was as interested in theatre and drama and all manner of performance at that time. So I wasn't really, I hadn't made any decisions, I, I just really didn't know. And I think the music thing, I think again, was about the personalities involved and working as a group to create something, which is what I've always been interested in doing. I've always played football and stuff like that when I was younger. But I like the idea of collaborations and creating events from that. That, that. I think that was the thing. And I think Liverpool gave you the leeway to do that now. And the art college system, certainly in Leeds, which was more based on the kind of Bauhaus thing than the traditional thing, 
and I think Leeds certainly put the the groundwork in but Liverpool gave you the leeway to be able to do it to a large extent that's sadly now gone from our colleges it just doesn't happen there aren't there aren't the courses that there were at all and I don't think there's the um, the wherewithal in a lot of the staff to go back to that I think everything is so prescribed now I think it's quite sad really I don't think it's as um, creative as it used to be at all and having spoken to a lot of people who are still involved in teaching art they'll, they nearly always say the same things. Could you play the guitar? Did you have lessons? No, I never had lessons. My brother actually taught me the first few chords. And my brother's younger than me, and a far better player than me and still is. But um, no, I just picked up a guitar, learned three or four chords, and that was about it. And then when I started playing with here in Liverpool with the band, the simplest thing for me to do was to go on bass. But as it happened, I love playing bass because I like. I like Motown, I like the rhythms, I'm, I'm, I, I enjoy the rhythms, so I was quite happy to be a bass player and still am. Don't consider myself to be any great shakes or anything, but I, I enjoy it and I enjoy making up riffs and I enjoy making things happen, I suppose you could say. Do you remember the interview? What did you have to take with you to get in to Liverpool? Into Liverpool. Uh, I brought a portfolio, some photographs, quite a lot of photographs and slides because a lot of my work I'd done prior to coming to Liverpool had been kind of installations I've made, some in Rosendale, uh, others up on the moors around Rosendale. Um, the local village people thought I was a nutcase. I once um, created a washing line of hardboard shirts and hung it outside my mum's house and I was taught of, of as being like the village idiot or something. And so they were always a bit freaked with some of the things I did. Uh, but yeah, that was, that was, that was it basically. So you lived in a flat in Upper Parliament Street? Yes. And then did you live with John and Henry? Or? No, John and Henry lived round the corner, down on Fern Grove, just off Lodge Lane. And it was me and Pete Hatton, uh, Rick Ashby, um, a couple of other people that lived on Upper Parliament Street. And then from there, I've always basically since then lived around the kind of Lark Lane, Egbeth area. Um, Albert Dock, mm -hmm. how did that form and what was it like being in Albert Dock? It was fun, it was, again, it was, I think there were seven of us at the time, and again it was more about a group of people making something happen together. We didn't really know what it was going to be, and we started off by doing covers of interesting songs really. Um, we did a photo session once over at um, I think it was West Kirby, or it could have been Formby when we took the surfboards that John and Henry had been making for their project and we did the kind of typical Beatles jumping off a sand dune and all that kind of stuff. And we'd gone over in my ancient van, which was a bit scary because coming back through the tunnel, the tunnel used to have what were more, almost like tram lines where the trucks had been going. So this van, which was a very old van, was more or less steering itself and I had like, there were all the lads in the back of the van and it was a bit hairy, that was a bit scary, but anyway, we got through it. But there's, I think Henry has some of those photographs knocking about somewhere, but that, that was fun. But uh, we started playing a few gigs, mainly around town. Uh, we supported deaf school a couple of times at that time, I think. And then um, we got the opportunity to play at Eric's because we'd become friends, mainly through Steve Hardstaff, we'd be, I'd become friends with Roger Eagle who was involved with Ken Testy and eventually Pete Fulwell, and they owned the Club Eric's. So I think it was the second night the club was opened, the Sex Pistols had been booked to do it, and Roger asked us if we'd like to do it. We had, I think it was a day to, to do a poster. Well, the poster is the one that you see in, um, it's in the museum now, um, but the picture on it is a picture of John and Henry on top of a cairn, I think on Coniston Old Man or somewhere because we'd been for a week with the college to do a kind of art project up there. Uh, so basically the poster was thrown together by me with some letter set, a, a picture of that we'd nicked out of the paper of Johnny Rotten and a picture of John and Henry on top of the cairn. So that's how that came about. And um, lo and behold, we went down quite well. Uh, next, we got asked to support Elvis Costello, by which time I think we may have changed our name. I think we had. Uh, and then we got asked to go down and play in London 
supporting Elvis Costello. At that time, uh, the record people who needed to get in touch with us would bring either the Albert or Keith on Light Lane because I don't think any of us had the uh, phones in our flats. Uh, so then we got a deal with Stiff Records and, that, and that's where it transferred to becoming yachts. Were you influenced by deaf school at all? Um, I suppose in a way we must have been because I think everybody was aware of, a, of an interest in what they were doing. But also you, you've got to remember at the time there was the, the David Bowie, Roxy Music thing as well, which everyone was familiar with. But Death School had a slightly different twist to it, and they were more more theatrical, I thought, and snappy dresses, and it was it was it was more of a stage thing, and I, I really liked them for that. You know, I thought they were, I thought they were a great band, Death School. They really were an important band, I think. Did being in the band affect your artistic studies? Well, yes, it did because uh, we got to the point where we needed to start touring more. And, and, and doing more gigs. So um, at one point we actually all left the college um, and then did what we were doing with yachts and then what happened was I, um, I left yachts, came back to Liverpool, just out, well I was in Liverpool obviously, and then but came back to the college and said look I'd rather come back and finish off my final year. By which time Jeff Nuttall had taken over at the art college. Well, I knew Jeff Nuttall from his time in Leeds when I was in Leeds, and he kind of recognised me. When I was in Leeds, I had long hair. When I was back, going back to college for the second time, I had kind of short, spiky hair. Uh, but as it happened, when I started uh, the course again at the college, mainly doing printmaking with Steve Hard stuff, I um, I met three lads at college again similar ideas to what we'd done in, with Albert Dock and that became a band called the Melatones. Well I'd just been, before that I'd just been playing with a band called Pink Military. But then, um, oh and It's Material early on. And then, but the Melatones we kind of got together and it was just a scratchy, noisy, fun band. Uh, and we did, a, we did an album too and um, they carried on as the Walking Seeds eventually to get to get quite good acclaim, you know. But um yeah I'd say Dash School had an certainly had an influence. And you know, again performance based. Yeah. Um so John left yachts to to go on to its immaterial. Yes, yes. Um why did you leave yachts? Uh by the time we got to doing the second album I was getting a bit bored with it and then it was a case of we had tracks that we were, everybody started writing stuff and we all had tracks that um, we wanted to on the album. I was unsuccessful in that. I just actually re-recorded one of those tracks this last few months uh, which is going to be released in another month or so. But um, I was just getting a bit fed up with it and times had changed. The two-tone thing had happened. Um, I'd done a bit of production with other Liverpool bands including Pete Wiley and Tear Up Explodes, etc. And I was I wanted to be part of what was still going on in Liverpool and yachts had become totally removed from that and I just thought this isn't my kind of thing anymore. Um, things were getting a bit acrimonious so I just that was it, you know, I just kind of left. Um, and did what some, did you do after art school? At first I was I did some a bit of tour managing with Pete Wiley and Black, four Pete Fullwell. And then I started working at the Everyman Theatre in the in the kind of youth side of it. It's kind of youth arts development work, which I did for about five years. Then I, be, then I was music officer at Merseyside Arts for a few years. Then I was an arts development officer up in Sefton and put a project together up there called Reverberation, which was ended up resulting in a couple of gigs at a place called Marshall Lane Community Centre, notably with Echo and the Bunnymen and KLF, which was the reverberation project but there was also a lot of other gigs went on there and the idea was we were building a community studio so that's why people had put the time and effort into to help us achieve it. Uh, from there I was I think that's when I became music officer for Merseyside Arts and that was about funding other arts projects. One of the ones which I did fight for to get funding for was Urban Strawberry Lunch who became successful. Um, but then, following that, um, a job came up running a thing called the Liverpool Music Centre. 
and I was quite fascinated in this because it was based in Central Hall and it was basically a charity which provided mu music lessons in all variety of instruments so we had lots of part-time teachers for anyone who was interested so that could be young people, old people, pensioners, you name it, whoever could come along and it was free sometimes, sometimes it was 50p in fact sorry um, but that was, I was the kind of director of the charity but my, I was actually paid by the city council we went to a great deal of effort to try and secure Central Hall as an arts hub to be developed and Phil Redmond and Jeff White were involved with that at the time and it almost came off as creating a cultural quarter from that end of uh, Renshaw Street right up to Hope Street. That all changed as developments have gone on. But that was that was quite early on, you know, in the re in the redesigning of Liverpool sort of thing. I think that's when actually the rope walks thing came up shortly after that. Uh, so I was there up until um, I took early retirement actually. I had a bad fall, smashed my leg up, was on was in a wheelchair for a while. In fact John took me to get the wheelchair at the time I think. Um, so consequently I took early retirement. Since then I've been doing, had a little gardening business which I quite enjoy because I like pottering about with plants and stuff. Uh, I've done a couple of delivery jobs, I'm doing a delivery job at present which is quite pleasant you know um, just run around in my own car and stuff and I've got another band together which we've been doing recording recently we've got a, an album coming out very shortly um, again working with a quite diverse and interesting bunch of people uh, so I'm quite enjoying it in my old age <laughs> so you've along with all the other people that were interviewing I've worked in the arts your entire life Yes, I would say so. So how do you feel about the British government cutting creative courses in schools? I've been appalled by it. Oh, I forgot I did lecture in art at both City College and Lippa for a while as well. But I find it a real shame. I, I just, I find it's a, I think it's a shame, not just for people who want to study art, I think it's a shame for society in general. Because if you start eradicating that kind of freedom of thought and freedom of speech, which inevitably things like this will lead to, People just become narrower and narrower, and with the digital technology explosion, young people aren't accept. There's no tactility in things anymore for me. People don't want to make things. The number of people I, I've met who haven't got any practical skills whatsoever. I think the thing about art college is it's a hands-on situation, and I, I think that's sadly lacking. And I think for government ministers who don't actually understand that because they don't have that kind of a background, I think it's a real shame and I think it's a a bit of a kind of uh, means to an end if you will quite sad very sad very sad it also makes you think and be able to problem solve and everything absolutely absolutely because you've got to find solutions for what it is you're trying to create make build whatever it is not just something you can do on a phone or in a digital situation or with you know a laptop any regrets no no, no. And ambitions? Any ambitions? Um, just to be regarded as someone that contributed something, I suppose. I can't think of anything much else to add to that, really. I just think it's... Uh, I've done quite a lot of stuff, and I've got quite a whole kind of raft of collectibles and stuff that I shouldn't have, but I have. Uh, in fact, a, a bunch of that is actually basically going to fund this album that we're doing at the moment, which is a box full of old badges from Eric's days, you know. So, uh, yeah, yeah, nothing else to add to that, really. Um, that's all my questions, but the Blackie would be perfect for the music thing that you were going to do in Central Yes, Hall. well, I did a few projects in the Blackie. Did you? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, John, do you want to say hey? Have you got anything to ask, or do you want to stay there? No, no. It's just I wanted you to um, to maybe talk about the spaces during your time at the art school, because we had uh, available to us a number of different buildings, yeah, yeah, and yeah. they had different feels. Oh, they? absolutely, yeah, yeah. I can do that. Yeah, if you could do that, and also about the notion of rehearsing, musical rehearsing in the. For the Albert, don't those kind of rooms you Next use? Next to the canteen. Yeah, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, if you yeah. could just enlighten us on a bit of that stuff. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, the other thing about the, the, the kind of diversity of the art college, there was a whole variety of spaces, one of which was the building, the deaf school, where deaf school got the name from, excuse me. Just to do that again. Just stopped. So the, one of the interesting things about the, the art school was the diversity of the buildings and the areas that you could work in, ranging from the deaf school building itself, where deaf school were, um, a lot of them were based when they were doing painting. Then you had the plaster shop in Myrtle Street, you had the woodwork and metalwork shops. Then across the way you go into the Hanneman building, which was where um, print was, print making, and screen printing, etc. Then you could go up into the plaster workshop, which was, there's one in Myrtle Street, but also there was a pottery and ceramics department. And I, I, I kind of pushed, pushed it a bit because I said, look, I want to go and dye some fabric, make some flags, make some ceramic things to add to it. And I have to admit, the likes of John and Pete helped me put some of this stuff together. We, we, I don't know if you remember, John, we went up to Formby Beach with my balloons and these sculptural things, and I was trying to change the, the environment of the, sorry, the, the perspective of the landscape, if you will. Um, so yeah, it was a case if you you could access different materials and forms. You weren't just you weren't just there with paints and an easel. You could use absolutely everything, and it was encouraged at the time. And that, we also had a, a a part kind of video studio come dark room area, which had some a very minimal synthesizer in it, and. You know, we were encouraged to use that. So ob obviously you would because this some of this stuff was new to us. They had a, a vacuum forming room as well, which was um, you could work with plastics and acrylics and all this kind of stuff. And it was all fascinating because it, you, you were getting access and hands on. So I worked in every one of those disciplines I mentioned to create the kind of stuff that I, w I wanted to make. But it was more about experimentation, about putting things together and utilizing what was there. There was, I mean, I do recall they had a, there was a video camera because if you remember, I mean, don't forget, this is the time when photocopies had just come out. Even that was exciting to use a photocopier at the time. Um, but there was a big video camera, which was like the size of a half house, which was a massive Sony beta camera, something like that, probably even older than that. But there was only one guy I had control, that was a guy called Dave Clapham. I think he filmed a bit of deaf school on it. I don't think he had actually filmed any Albert Dock. But I remember we did, speaking again about spaces. One of the places that we did a gig in, we worked on, was the uh, the Bridewell, which was opposite the Royal Hospital. And Dave Clapham actually lived there. So they did, did, did this big party, so we decided to fill the place with sand and have it as a beach party. I made a giant cactus. John and Henry made more surfboards, and it was just a general free-for-all party, but it was good fun. But it was that whole thing of, utilising spaces, utilising found and made objects, putting things together, different groups of people working together on, you know, ran, random things really, but making something happen at the end of the day. So yeah, 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 interesting use of spaces. Well that's another thing, that it gives you um, team building skills. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And again, that lack of tactile involvement, to me that's the opposite of what digital technology is doing, you know, those that skills are rapidly declining, I think. That plastic moulding thing was still there when I was there 20 years ago. Dave Morris. Yes, yes, that yeah. That was his yeah, baby, yeah. wasn't it? Oh yeah, absolutely. I was going to make this big sonic thing that came down from the... Mm. Uh, so, rehearsing for Albert Dock. Well, this is rehearsing band rehearsals, yeah. so if you could just tell us a bit about that. And the other thing is... Uh, do you think music was actually encouraged by the staff at the art school, or did they stand in the way a little bit? I think it was a bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Um, as regards rehearsing a band at the art college, I think, I think actually, because Deaf School had been quite successful by when they won the Record Mirror Award for Best New Band or whatever it was and got a record deal, I think some of the staff were a bit in awe, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So consequently, um, it was um, some of the staff would encourage particular people. Other staff were dead against it, and it was quite obvious which ones they were. Maybe the painting staff, I would say, were against oh, yeah. these musicians. Uh, but we didn't really, we didn't really take much notice of it. We used to rehearse in a room that deaf school had been using, just across from where the canteen was downstairs in Hope Street, just a room probably twice the size of this. 
with mainly their equipment in. I remember buying a, a bass amp and a cabinet for 15 quid and I think the bass of guitar I bought was about 10 quid, it was rubbish. But we managed to get all this stuff in the room. Then we found a keyboard, or Bob Props helped us find a keyboard, which is Henry Sparfee's organ. But I spent about two days cleaning wallpaper scrapings out of it before it could get made to work. But it did get made to work and I think he still has it, I'm not sure. <laughs> so I just wanted a bit of detail about things. Yeah, it's, it's like um, a normal madness being at art school, isn't it? Everybody's doing like crazy things, but it's just like perfectly. I suppose to an extent, but I think there was a there was there was some people being quite fastidious and quite straight about the whole thing, and but I think that was more. To be honest, if you got more over to the graphics side, because it, it, funnily enough, I did a lecture up in Burnley a few years back. And I, I'd said to people, similar to the question you started with, you know, why did you go to, what did you go to art college for? And I said to them, I said to these students I was teaching or talking to, for me it wasn't about going to art college so that I could get a job in a design office or in, in a, you know, something that was already prescribed. It's about going there and finding out what the options were before you start making any decisions at all. That's how I found it best for me to approach it. And I think a lot of other people probably approached it the same way, but I also think that some people had specific needs or guidelines that they wanted to stick to, so they, they did that, you know. So if someone was fastidiously into the painting or whatever, they perhaps wanted to equate themselves with a the member of staff who was perhaps recognised for their painting skills. But um, I don't know if I'm right in that, actually, no, but, you know. Sorry, that's a bit vague. I got no, disturbed. that's really good.